Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities, supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Well, welcome to the second session of day two of the 2024 Exploring for the Future program showcase. I'm Susanna McFarlane and I'm the director of the repository here at Geoscience Australia. And it is my pleasure to be moderating this next session titled Quantitative Characterization of Australia's Surface and Near Surface. I'd like to start this afternoon's session by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people as the traditional owners of the Canberra region where I'm based today, who have lived and shared culture in the area for many thousands of years. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also recognise our First Nations partners and traditional custodians of the lands that we have accessed throughout this programme. And finally, I extend a warm welcome to all First Nations Australians joining the showcase today. From this morning's session, we heard presentations from teams who mapped and characterised the Australian tectonic plate at depths from a few to many hundreds of kilometres using passive seismic, magnetotelerics and Xenocris data sets. If you missed that session or you would like to access the outputs that we are releasing, please refer to the links on our showcase webpage. The work that we are showcasing was only made possible through extensive collaboration and we sincerely thank all of our collaborators for their valuable contributions. During this session today, you're going to hear presentations on characterising Australia's surface and near surface using airborne electromagnetics, surface geochemistry and also mapping of heavy minerals. Significant components of these data sets were conceived and rolled out as part of the Exploring for the Future program. And as you are going to hear throughout the session, they have provided powerful new insights for exploration and also natural resource management. As in the other sessions, there will be a questions and answers session following the three presentations. So please ask questions of all our presenters by using the Q&A panel at the top of your screen. Our speakers this afternoon are presenting on behalf of a large team, and that includes many scientists, administrators and other professionals who have all contributed to the work being showcased. If they can't answer your questions, they'll be very happy to take those on notice. And you can also submit questions via our email, eftf at ga.gov.au. So our first speaker for this session is Dr. Anandarup Ray, who will be talking about AUSAEM, the national coverage and sharpening near-surface imaging. Anandarup, or Anand, 
is a senior geosci uh, geophysicist interested in applying mathematics to subsurface imaging. Anand has worked internationally across industry, academia and government since 2007. Over to you, Anand. Today I'm going to be talking about the Oz AEM program, uh, particularly some of the more technical aspects related to the imaging of the Australian subsurface. Um, this is a labor of love for many people, and in particular, I would like to talk about my colleagues Yusen Le Cooper and Rusty Brody, without whom none of this would have been possible, and of course, without the support of all of these people. And I'm not sure I've gotten everybody on there, and if I haven't, I apologize. But as you will see, this has been a monumental piece of work. And of course, I am Ananda Rup Ray, also a geophysicist at Geoscience Australia. Um, so first of all, let's get to the uh, Kimberleys. And, um, it is a unique and wonderful part of Australia, and if you've not been there, I do urge you highly to get there. Um, it is an ancient landscape, and the bones of the earth express themselves as surface geology. Um, these rocky landforms are curved and gnarled, and on top of which there's this marine ecosystem, which is absolutely unique. It is a wonder of the world. But as I said, there is a surface expression of geology. And if you were to follow the surface expression deeper into the Earth, you would see, uh, as you see on the bottom right there, that down to about depths of 400 uh, to 600 meters, we have these curved um, structures that make themselves evident as you're looking in 3D into the Earth. Um, and we're able to do this through the Oz AM imaging that uh, we've done in the Kimberley area of Western Australia. Now, if we were to go about a thousand kilometers south to the Esperance region in um, Western Australia again, uh, you'd see that um, the surface geology is perhaps a little less spectacular. However, this area is no less spectacular because OD6 minerals have found this highly prospective rare earth element deposit uh, hosted within clays. And I've highlighted these two lines from the Oz AEM data set, again, at the uh, bottom right. Uh, this is Oz AEM 20, which they used to be able to identify this extremely exciting prospect. Now, if we travel then uh, a few thousand uh, kilometers northeast and we get to Queensland and we get close to Tambo, you will see that, again, the, the surface geology or the uh, surface expression of geology is, is not really present, and it doesn't really tell you that the world's largest freshwater aquifer lies underneath. There's the Great Artesian Basin underneath over there. And again, Geoscience Australia comes to the rescue because we've carried out a survey in the area, and if you look at this one particular line, you can see the intake beds of the uh, Great Artesian Basin from where recharge takes place by water gets into the Artesian Basin. And again, these 3D images are of um, subsurface geology down to depths of about 200 to 600 meters, depending on uh, the overlying geology. And this just wouldn't be possible to get an idea of if you had satellite imagery or if you were looking from above. So um, no matter what your application, whether you are trying to preserve an ecosystem in the Kimberleys or you're trying to do deep basement mapping, or whether you're doing rare earth element exploration hosted in clays close to Esperance, or whether you're trying to make a conceptual model of the uh, Great Artesian Basin. And that's something my colleague, Dr. Uh, Nadej Rolet, will be telling you more about as well. Um, Geoscience Australia has you covered uh, with um, airborne electromagnetics. Now, we can do this almost all over Australia. And um, you can see a little bit of spacing between the lines that we have over there, and that's because they're 20 kilometers apart. And we have collected over 300,000 line kilometers of 20 kilometer space data. And, and this is really an unparalleled feat the world over. And uh, just for some context, and because we're in Australia and we have to go to the moon and back, um, the average distance to the moon is about 384,000 kilometers. So if you put together the uh, 20 kilometer space data, as well as the uh, more densely spaced infill data, um, yeah, we, we have gone the distance. And at the bottom right are two imaging codes that we have used to do this. So not only do we collect the data, but we process and invert it ourselves to make these beautiful images. But how is this done, you may ask? And this is done primarily through aircraft. And um, on my right here is a fixed wing aircraft. And on my left there is a helicopter. But because the details might not be evident in the blue sky that you see over there, because we only show you images from good weather, because that's when we like to fly. Um, I've done a bit of an animation for you. 
And you can see a transmitting current loop around the fixed wing aircraft and it's towing behind it this red bird. And for the helicopter systems to your left, the entire transmitter receiver assembly is towed underneath uh, by the helicopter itself. And there's a power source right there, but you might not be able to see it. Um, this is illustrated better in the next schematic. And um, the first thing I'll ask you to note is that helicopters, of course, move to the left <laughs> at speeds of about 100 to 200 kilometers an hour. And moving the other direction is a fixed wing aircraft. And they move at speeds of about 200 to 300 kilometers an hour. And um, the transmitter loop for a helicopter system is, is at about uh, 40 meters height. And the transmitter loop for a fixed wing system is at about 120 meters height. And the loop actually is around the aircraft itself. And for the fixed wing system, as I said, you have this receiver bird with antennae coils. And they're about 110 meters behind and 80 meters above the ground. Um, so as you can see, um, we, we are able to cover uh, relatively close to the earth, large swathes of land and, and survey the earth, doing one sounding after the other, like that. And what it is that we're trying to do is recover the resistivity profile of the earth while we're carrying sounding after sounding after sounding out. And actually what it is that we're doing is we're sending a signal into the earth, an electromagnetic signal, and it looks like that. And the game here is to be able to recover the electromagnetic conductivity, or its inverse, resistivity profile in the earth. That's that blue line you see here. That's um, changing with depth on this axis. And, and this is known in mathematical parlance um, as uh, solving an inverse problem. So you have the data D. And out of the data D, using the physics F, you want to get this blue line, which is the model M. However, it turns out that you don't make any friends explaining inverse problems to people. So I will just show you an animation. So here we start on the left with a very simple model of a profile of resistivity within the Earth. And as you can see, the responses due to that resistivity model are the black lines. And they're moving closer and closer to the um, acquired data. And in the end, you had that blue line over there, which was a model of measurements actually taken within the Earth. And here it is again. And finally, when we get to a satisfactory model, which fits the data within the noise, this is what it looks like. And um, this is the mathematics of how it's done. And for those of you who are interested in such, um, this is exactly the same kind of equation the uh, machine learning people solve. Instead of using the physics of Maxwell's equations in F there, they use complicated neural networks. But we geophysicists have been doing it for longer. <laughs> we can also do this stochastically. And the stochastic approach is to throw not one model at it, but to throw um, hundreds of thousands of models at it. And you can see that there's an ensemble of models to your left. And the response to each of those models in the ensemble comes out on your right. As you have more models, these black lines, which are the responses um, that we predict, become thicker and darker because there's more models. And again, they fit the data. And the thing that I would like to draw your attention to are the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentiles of data uh, of, of the conductivity. And when these percentiles of conductivity are close to each other, or when they move in unison, like you see over there, you can be more certain of the changes in conductivity that you see within the Earth. And um, for those of you who are interested, um, this is actually a manifestation of Bayes' theorem. But I have found no ways to make friends talking about Bayes' theorem, so I'll just leave it there. Um, Again, uh, this is just an illustration of how the plane moves along the line. And you're basically carrying out that sounding imaging problem you know, at every point along the line. And you fly your aircraft um, along a particular survey, uh, along set track lines. And this is a survey carried out for the groundwater folks at Geoscience Australia. And my colleague, Dr. Sarah Buckerfield, will be talking more to this. And so you have a little aircraft that goes along these set uh, paths. And um, you know it goes perpendicular. And if I haven't already said so, this is in the uh, New South Wales region, the Upper Darling floodplains. And then you generate these models of conductivity at every location. And then uh, you put them together, and you construct a 3D model. And then you can slice and dice it however you want. And you give it to the geologists. And they really go to town with this. Because at the end of the day, Nobody cares about the mathematics. Nobody cares about the conductivity. What geologists like to talk about are rocks.
And so what you have to talk about are what color corresponds to which rock. But unfortunately, the story is not quite that simple. Um, if you're a groundwater person, then, well, um, red normally corresponds to conducting things, and that's bad because it represents um, you know, saline water, which is not so good for drinking. And the fresh stuff is, is blue, and that's low uh, conductivity and high resistivity. Well, however, if you're interested in like the regolith or you're interested in studying landforms, well then, you know, red might not be a bad thing because red might host clays which are conducting and that might have minerals and uh, the blue might be sandstones and other kinds of minerals which tell you about the geology. So it really depends whether you're a regolith person or a water person, what it is you're looking for. But what I would like you to note is no matter whether you work in resistivity or whether you work in conductivity, um, reds are highly conducting, blues are extremely resistive, and there's a whole range of rocks and types of geology that can be inferred from a particular conductivity. So there's an element of non-uniqueness here. And so if you look at one particular airborne electromagnetic sec uh, section, as my colleague um, Sebastian Wong has uh, presented here, you need to convert this into a geological schematic. And you'll, you'll be able to do so by looking at the highly conducting parts and then he's got a highly resistive part over there. Then he's got another conductor on top. And then this is what geologists spend a lot of their time doing, carefully delineating folds and folds and structures and looking at wells to be able to reduce this non-uniqueness to come up with a conceptual model like that. And if you have any problems with this conceptual model, because not all geologists can agree, you can take this up with Sebastian Wong, who will be presenting again in the showcase. And you're used to looking at sections of this sort. And in particular, I'll ask you to draw your attention to the first row over there, which I've outlined in red. What you're looking at there is a, a typical Oz AEM section that I have boxed in red. And this section is hundreds of kilometers long. And um, what you're seeing there is a representation of the subsurface geology down to depths of about 400 meters. Um, and it's a beautiful image of what is going on at the subsurface, and perhaps your attention is drawn to this feature which looks a little bit like a W, um, but I'll ask you to hold on to that thought because we can do a little more than this, and I would venture a little better than this, because if you look underneath that top row, you've got, again, our friends, the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentiles of conductivity at every location, and if we look at these, I can make some judgments at about 200 meters depth, so that's sort of halfway down any of these sections, um, what the geology is doing there and how certain I can be about some of these things. So for example, the green box, I can be relatively certain because if you look at this blue bit over there, it's a repeating pattern in all three percentiles. So that means the percentiles are changing in unison and that means we can be relatively certain of this. Whereas if we look at this red box over here, except the top where we see a conductor in every percentile, there, there, and there, underneath it, it's really uncertain. So we're, we're quite certain that we don't know what's going on underneath that top conductor. Um, for the yellow box over there, you know, things are sort of in between the two. Um, you know, things are, are not as uncertain uh, beneath the, the topmost few layers. And so we can use this idea of uncertainty to inform how we might do our interpretations. So if I were to put myself in Seb's shoes, which is, which is a very tall ask, I might draw lines that are like that to delineate the geology um, at that you know, W-shaped feature for, for those of us who are not specialists in geology. So this might be something that leads to a particular kind of faulted structure. Um, however, with our ideas of uncertainty now, we can say that that looks more like a sin form, and we might want to draw this thing that looks more like a smiley face over there. So then we might want to say that since we're relatively certain of this structure and we didn't have that idea of uncertainty looking at any one image, we can now reformulate our interpretation to put that sin form up on the AUSAEM imaging that we're used to like that. So this has tremendous implications for the AUSAEM imaging because it means that we can use uncertainty to actually get ourselves out of a pickle because we can make decisions based on more information. Um, we can do the same thing in other areas of Queensland as well, further to the north. And this is a particular set of AUSAEM lines. 
And you can do the same exercise as before. You can follow this geology in a particular manner, and I might put these two black lines on there. However, you can see for the exact same lines in the next row that um, the geology is perhaps a little more continuous because you can see the red bits continuing along. So perhaps I ought to have done this. So if I can do this using the probabilistic imaging, and it's the same earth over there, well, I should perhaps propagate this new knowledge I have back to my old interpretation and do that. So I can get a longer, more consistent interpretation. And this brings out two things, essentially. How we're not, with airborne electromagnetics, sensitive equally to all kinds of geology. So we're more sensitive to conductors than we are to resistors. And probabilistic imaging just highlights this fact and allows us to make better decisions because we're able to throw um, more statistics at making an inference of what the interpretation ought to be in a particular area. And we're not limited to doing this in small parts of Australia because, as you know, at Geoscience Australia, we like to go big. So we have done all of the uh, probabilistic imaging for about 60% of the acquired AUSAEM data. So this is what we're calling phase one of the probabilistic AEM imaging or inversion. And none of this would have been possible without the GADI supercomputer at the National Computational Infrastructure. We've generated images of the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentiles. And um, you can see that much more detail can be brought out from these images than is possible using only one deterministic image. And this is a world first. Uh, we're not aware of anyone else having done this before. We have used 41,600 CPUs at a time for up to two and a half hours. And we've done this <laughs> various times, as I've pointed out over there, with, with our testing as well. And you can download all of this at uh, these URLs shown down there. And um, you can also look at this in the EFTF portal. You first have to go to our portal at portal.ga.gov.au. And then you have to click on layers there. And once you click on layers, there's a next step where you click on 3D layers. And once you click on 3D layers, you'll get another menu which says, well, what do you want to do with it? What are some various 3D options? And you can leave these untouched at the start. Um, you can then get to airborne electromagnetics. And then you can select a data set of your choice, such as the uh, probabilistic inversions here from the Eastern Resources Corridor. And then, of course, depending on your operating system, you might get the Hourglass of Doom or the Spinning Beach Ball of Joy. Uh, give it a few seconds and do this on a beefy computer because there's, there's a lot of data that's being rendered over here. We haven't pre-rendered this for you. And then you'll get an image like that. And I really didn't do very much more besides just follow the, the instructions that I screenshotted while making these slides. Do use your mouse buttons carefully, and it might take a little getting used to if you're not a geological interpreter. Use your left button to drag, use the wheel to zoom in and out, and use the third mouse button to, to pan. Or if you've played Doom like me, we call the strafing. Um, well, you can customize this in ways that we haven't been able to do before. Um, you can use different color bars. Uh, note that we're changing to the Google recommended, the Google Research Labs recommended turbo color bar, which is perceptually more uniform than what we'd been using in the past. You can also set limits on the uh, ranges of colors that you'd like to see. And you can also select different percentiles. And the nice thing is, if you change any one of these properties on any line, it propagates to the entire data set. So you don't have to sit and click everything. Um, and for those of you who've been astute observers, you'll note that these colors are slightly more vibrant than the previous ones. And that's because I've changed percentiles on you over here. So you can select different percentiles. You can put in the low percentile, or the mid percentile, or the high percentile, and look at different aspects of the information available to you. There have been massive, massive numbers of outputs uh, from this program. And I've listed most of the AUSAEM data sets over there, um, most of which were inverted by the Airborne Electromagnetics Activity Leader, Yusan Le Cooper, uh, then Ross Brody and myself. There's a whole bunch of journal articles and abstracts down there. And uh, thousands and thousands of lines of code that have been written by Ross and myself and hundreds of thousands of line kilometers of data that have been inverted by Yusen and Ross and me. And we've got all the code for you there. So, you know, we go the distance. We write the code. We acquire the data. We test the code on the data that's been acquired. We test the data with the code that's been written. And we give you a product that seems to be very useful for a whole number of situations, which I'm sure and I hope my colleagues will talk about. 
And none of this would have been possible without the help of our partners, of course, our parent department, and the excellent support that we've gotten from all the various state and territory surveys. In particular, I would like to call out uh, Queensland because they were extremely supportive during the first phase of Oz AEM and the Geological Survey of Western Australia, who bought into the idea of 20 kilometer imaging and helped us profusely with Oz AEM 20 and, and getting the entire Western Australia uh, component of Oz AEM covered. Uh, and we wouldn't have been able to do this without their support. Um, so thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Anand. Those new inversions that you have released look like an extraordinary step forwards. Um, not only are you providing an image of the subsurface, but also the statistical rigor behind it, and I'm sure that this will lead to more reliable use. We're now going to our second presentation for the session by Phil Main, who's going to be presenting on unlocking the surface geochemistry of Australia. Phil is the module leader for the National Geochemical Framework of Australia. Phil graduated from the University of Queensland with a Bachelor of Science with honours before starting at Geoscience Australia in 2014 as part of the graduate programme. Since then, Phil has worked on multiple geochemical surveys, with most recently he's been working on the levelled geochemical baseline of Australia, which is a project aimed at producing a seamless data set using Geoscience Australia's large holdings of surface geochemistry data. Thank you so much, Phil. Hello and thank you for coming along today. Um, so I'm Phil Main and today I'm going to be talking about unlocking the surface geochemistry of Australia. Now this is really the work of a large team, in this case is the National Geochemical Framework of Australia, uh, which composes a few different projects um, of which I'm going to be covering today. So this has been a strong team effort. Um, so we've had John Wilford, Patrice Caratat, Dave Champion, Sir Dipta and Patrick really all provide expertise and leadership in here. Um, each of them ran different components of this large activity and ran their own projects. So without them, this work just wouldn't have been undertaken. So just a bit of a background as to surface geochemistry at Geoscience Australia and our predecessors. So it all started back in the 1940s. Now, this work was really focused um, at the high resolution deposit scale, looking at the variation of the geochemistry across an actual mineral deposit. That is very different to what we do today. And it, started, it was only a thing for a kind of a couple of decades before they started branching out. So as we moved up into the 1960s, we found that there's a distinct shift from that deposit scale information through to looking at more of a regional picture and how the geochemistry, one, responds to those mineral deposits at the local scale, but also how it feeds into the bigger picture of a region. So these were really high density surveys, and I'll touch on what I mean by high density a bit later. Um, but they focused on distinct map sheets or project areas and then as we moved on up until, I guess, the 1990s as a culmination, where we really had large regional projects covering large areas. Um, so the 90s saw the Cape York project, which covered a large proportion of Cape York uh, down through North Queensland um, at a scale we just wouldn't undertake today. Now, these surveys looked at, one, the geology of how um, the geochemistry and the geology were interacting and how we could use one to predict the other. Two, what mineral systems could we discover as part of that? Um, but they were the main two focuses. And once we kind of hit the end of the 1990s, we had a bit of a change in the guard and a change in the geochemistry team into the early 2000s. And this saw a distinct change in how we undertook geochemistry at GA. From then, we moved from this high density surveys through to what we consider now low density through to ultra low density. Um, so the purpose also changed. Um, it became identifying greenfield areas of potential mineral exploration and really trying to drive interest in a region and not look at specific mineral deposits. It was also about classifying the geochemistry and how it related to the geology, as well as also trying to develop the um, geochemical environmental baseline. So how the environmental background of geochemistry changes, how any inputs such as anthropogenic uh, input can change that over time and really set that baseline value. Now this culminated in 2009 in the National Geochemical Survey of Australia. Uh, this is our national geochemistry product and focuses on 91% of the country. Um, you'll see the bit of the data gap later and I'll talk about it a bit more. Um, but this is what we'd classify as an ultra low density survey, but provides valuable insight for the entire country that we wouldn't be able to do at a higher resolution. Since then, we've undertaken several other regional geochemical surveys, the Northern Australia Geochemical Survey, which I'll talk about a bit later, and then the main focus of the first part of this talk 
the reanalyzed geochemistry work that we've undertaken, and the level geochemical baseline of Australia. As I mentioned, we have a large number of historic surveys. Now, these surveys have been collected, as I said, since the 1940s, and they're not always easy to identify where they're located. Um, a lot of the older surveys are pre-GPS, um, so a lot of the information we have is an old map of about this resolution um, in a report that's hand-drawn, and that is your location information. So we've had to go through, take this map, georeference it, try and find where the road to Kurundi Homestead is, this particular old section of the Stuart Highway and the streams, and really try and geolocate them to find the location of those samples. But it's a lot of work, but they're incredibly valuable. A lot of these samples are in areas where we've had development, uh, we wouldn't be able to access them, or it'd be simply cost prohibitive to collect them these days. Unfortunately, we can't really use the original analysis results. Um, they're either so old that there was only a few elements collected, um, and typically those prior to the 2000s, so that was up into the 1990s, didn't have any quality information presented with them. Um, so that means that, great, we have data, but we don't know how usable it is and how useful it is. Uh, thankfully, we do hold a large number of these um, samples in-house in our repository, so being able to access them in order to reanalyze them. Now, as I mentioned, these historic surveys are at a high density. So for some context here, the National Geochemical Survey of Australia, the NGSA, uh, was collected at one sample per 5,500 square kilometers. Uh, NAGS, that regional survey, was one sample per 500 square kilometers. So we're really seeing several orders of magnitude difference when you look at some of these historic surveys that were collected on an order of either one sample per square kilometer, up to the lowest being one in 10 to 15. So really high density work that was conducted previously, and it's just too cost prohibitive to do that work these days. So they really provide valuable insight into regions at a density that we wouldn't be able to collect now. But what do we want to do with them? In steps the level geochemical baseline. Um, so the whole idea was we could take all of our surface geochemistry holdings and produce a seamless product of surface geochemistry for Australia without any artifacts or introduced variation due to the samples being collected through time. Um, so in order to do this, we undertook a rigorous literature review of what we'd undertaken in the past. Uh, quite a few surveys we just didn't know about. They were brought to our attention through people emailing in questions or references in journal papers. So a lot of it was quite a bit of detective work to try and figure out what we'd actually undertaken. As I mentioned, we only really focused on those prior to the year 2000 due to the lack of quality information for reanalysis. Unfortunately, we couldn't locate everything. Those samples in the 1960s proved particularly difficult to locate. And that's mainly due to the fact that they use non-unique sample numbers. It's really difficult to find sample number one in a sea of sample number ones when there's no other project information. There was some information missing. So as you can see by these red dots, they're the samples we just couldn't locate within the surveys um, that we did reanalyze. So it's mainly focused in two main areas, um, Georgetown in this A figure and in B, um, the Northern Territory side of that survey region there. But we have been able to bring in the old data to complement the new reanalyzed data in order to really gain as much information as possible. Now, it might sound as simple as just combining all these data sets together to produce a product, but it's not. If we look at the Southern Thompson Geochemical Survey, for example, um, this was two surveys that were collected over two different time periods. They were separated by a few years, but the sampling methodology, some of the sampling teams were the same, and the analytical methods were identical. But when you get into looking at the data and using more statistical analysis of it, in this case, we'll talk about principal component analysis. Um, so that's a dimensionality reduction tool. We take our 50, 60 elements and we compress them down into groupings. And these groupings explain the variance within the data set. So the most variance is explained by principal component one, followed by principal component two, et cetera, et cetera. And when we plotted up principal component one and principal component two, we found the main source of variance within the data sets was actually the, the survey that we collected as part of. And this is the analytically introduced variation. So using a different instrumentation, different labs, means that we get these subtle differences within the data sets, which actually can have significant impacts on, one, the interpretation of the data, and two, using them together. So we applied a few different leveling methodologies in order to try and correct this. And thankfully, we were able to, which paved the way for really building the level geochemical baseline. So what level of methodologies did we settle on? Um, there's three main approaches that we took. The first is reanalysis, which is as simple as it sounds. You take your old sample, you reanalyze it, and you compare the old with the new, and you use a linear regression in order to correct the data. The second is to use the standards that we run as part of our data sets. 
Um, this is slightly less desirable as a single standard as it's only one point in the data. Um, so if we say our point is over here, that means that any deviation from that one-to-one, -one, if it isn't a parallel line, we're gonna see some shifting at the higher and lower values. And I guess the most preferred um, would be a multi-standard approach. So that is taking the same standards that will run as part of both uh, different groups of data, taking the median and then plotting a linear regression through them in order to get the correction factor across a range of concentration values. Because of the density of these um, old surveys, when we reanalyzed them, we just couldn't plot them as a whole country. It was just a sea of black dots as we tried to display what information was there. So for the reanalyzed data, when we released it, each of the surveys or map sheets has been released as an individual product. So you can flick through each individual element in order to actually look at the data without having to open it up into ARC or QGIS and really interrogate it yourself. All of them are classified based on two keys exploration principles to highlight areas of interest, and they're all overlaying on a Krieg background in order to draw the eye to those areas of interest as well. So the current extent of level geochemical baseline, um, it's approximately 12,000 samples now in scale. Um, it's largely focused in Northern Australia. Um, that's because clearly a lot of the old BMR people enjoyed the tropical north, um, so a lot of the old focus was there. But we do have some surveys from the southern states and quite a few from around Canberra. Obviously the glare and gap is this WA section into South Australia. That really marks a gap in the National Geochemical Survey of Australia. That's something we haven't been able to really fill at all. It's an ongoing gap and hopefully in the future we'll be able to fill it. But as part of this work we did make several internal project standards which allow us to level the data. Now these project standards are available if you'd like to contact us to get some, which means that we can try and bring in any um, surveys you undertake and bring it in and level it together to really build a picture of Australia and the landscape. Now this is just the surface uh, geochemistry, the regolith side of things or the stream sediments. Um, John and Patrice took this a step further. So they started by expanding the coverage. Um, we don't just hold surface geochemistry data, we also have a lot of rock geochemistry data which covers a significant part of the country. Um, obviously this includes core, and various other dredge samples, seismic transect samples. But in this case, they just focused on the surface rock samples that had been collected. And this really helps to fill in the coverage. Even if we compare to the previous map, we can see a significantly high density of sample points, um, particularly in WA um, and up into the Northern Territory as well, to really infill what information we have, but also diversify um, the type of information we have. Before, when I was talking about it, it was just surface regolith information, and now we're including rock. And the reason for that is John and Patrice really wanted to predict the surface content of major oxide elements across the entire country. And in order to do that, you need a diversity in your material type in order to truly classify the surface. So how did they do it? Well, they used machine learning in this case. They took the data that I presented before, overlaid it on a series of different data sets used Uncover ML, which has been developed here at Geoscience Australia, and using the National Computational Infrastructure um, has produced predictive maps for each of the major oxides across the entire country at an 80 meter pixel resolution. But before we can get there, there's a bit of data filtering and really boring work that needs to occur first. And that's really because whilst regolith data may be somewhat homogeneous at a, a scale, rock data definitely isn't. Um, as you can see here, it can be really difficult to ascertain where the sample was collected from. Geologists don't really want to collect a sample of the bulk rock. It's usually pretty boring. Um, they like to find the interesting thing, whether it's a vein or an intrusion, and really get that information. But you can also end up with multiple points in a single small area, which is really problematic when you're trying to undertake machine learning, which uses a variety of data sets such as satellite imagery. When you have all these points clustered in a small location, we can't differentiate them. So they needed to filter out those points one, so there was only a single point per pixel of um, the input data sets, but also try and get the representative sample. So this involved a few steps in terms of overlaying the geology and the points to try and check the chemistry, removing any points that were unfeasible. So say any major oxides above 100%, it's just not possible, so they remove those as bad data, as well as try to correct any um, GPS drift location issues by, again, checking that geology the geochemistry to try and see if it made sense. And I mentioned them a couple of times now as these input data sets that we use to help the predictions. These are what we call the covariates. And we've used them to predict each of the major elements. We set a list of what we use for the model prediction, um, but the algorithm itself determines the weighting of each of these. So it will change for each of the different major oxides. And um, for some, 
Uh, climate may be the biggest driver. For others, it may be the gamma potassium forium ratio that really drives them. But these are all national products covering the country at an 80 meter pixel resolution. So this is a Landsat single band. We have the surface geology. And finally, is another example, the forum potassium ratio from radiometrics. So all of these are stacked together and are intersected against the points in order to really try and get a good prediction across the country. So I guess the good thing, the predictive maps. So for each of the major oxides, we've produced um, one of these predictive maps. In this case, we've got calcium, um, which shows the distribution even in areas where we don't have any data at all. And that's really thanks to those national coverages of those covariates being able to build those training relationships and then predict from there. As you can see, we've also produced a plot of the data, so how it fits. We do see some of the data is, the line here is driven by the outliers. So when you look at the heat density, you can see it really sits more close to that one-to-one. -one. The other thing to note in this particular plot, you can see in these lower values, there's a lot of straight lines. And that's actually just an inherent factor of using some of the older data. It's really the detection limits and the resolution of the data. There's not much you can do when your concentration range is 5, 10, 15, versus a prediction that would be 5.5, 5.4. So what you start to see is these big lines at the lower values. So don't pay much attention to those really. They don't really provide much information. It's all well and good to have a predictive map, but how useful is it? How well does it predict the surface? Um, so for each of these products, we've produced what we call the coefficient of variance. Um, so that is the standard deviation of the predictions divided by the median, just in order to normalize it to produce um, a product that you can actually look at and use in a sensible way. Um, so in this case, we've got aluminum oxide. And we've actually got a pretty low um, variance on this here. So we're considering that less than 0.1 of a percent on the low end, up to kind of half a percent on the high end. So it may be that you look at a prediction from aluminium and this uncertainty map and you say, you know what, I'm actually happy with those levels of variance. I want to use the entire predictive area. Other elements aren't necessarily as good. You may see up to 20, 30% variance on that on the upper end. So you may decide that you cut out those areas as just being unusable. And that's really helpful for one, interpreting the data, but two, any planning and um, interpretation work that you do as part of it. So, well, what do we use this data for? Well, we've now got a list of all the different major oxide elements predicted across the country. Um, and that's really powerful for one, finding those areas where we have data gaps, looking at these predictive results and going, this area is pretty bland, there's not much of interest going on here. Maybe we won't go there as a priority, but we may identify some other areas or regions that are of interest, and we can target those areas for any potential uh, future follow-up work on the ground and actually look at what's causing those results and really infill our ga gaps in knowledge. But we can also combine the products together. Um, so in this case here, we've got a turning plot of the iron oxide, silicon oxide, and aluminum oxide. And this really um, can help us see what's going on within the landscape. So the blues on this kind of bottom edge here are the sand dunes, which you can see from either an image or a lot of the input covariates. But we also start to see the granites coming through in these pinks, that kind of mixing of sil silicon aluminum. But we can also see how that geochemistry is trailing through the landscape. So we can see this pink is draining in from these granites and then feeding into the floodplain. So we can really start to interrogate where our geochemical signature is coming from within the landscape and try and trace it back to some of the sources. This can be used in combination with a variety of different other data sets as well, such as weather and intensity to really help understand what's going on within our data set. So what impact have we seen from the geochemistry that we've undertaken as part of Exploring for the Future? Well, if I use the Northern Australia Geochemical Survey, for example, we've seen significant tenement uptake on the back of this data set. We've had nearly 75,000 square kilometers of new mineral exploration tenements taken up. That's an area roughly the size of the Czech Republic. So significant investment has gone in based on this data set. Now, there's also been a distinct change as well in the kind of things that it's been explored for. Back when the uh, data set first released, there was mainly a focus on kind of base metals, copper, those kind of traditional systems for uh, the Northern Territory in North Queensland. But as time's gone on, as we've pushed and towards more critical minerals, we've seen this transition to net zero, we've really seen a drive and change in what we're looking for. So more recently, we've seen significant tenement uptake looking at rare earth elements in the surface, in the clays. And that's really been a distinct difference. So geochemistry used to be kind of numero uno a tool for finding areas of interest back when we're looking in the cover. As we've moved undercover, it's kind of taken a bit more of a back seat but now the cover's back in play. There's all these new mineral system types that we're looking at, rare earth elements, critical minerals, 
uh, which means that surface geochemistry is back on top of kind of the ultimate tool for picking up these deposits. It is, at the end of the day, the direct detection of the system of interest that we're after. We've also seen that the archive samples provide a great way of getting increased coverage across the country. Um, they provide access uh, to areas that we wouldn't be able to get it to on the ground, or it would be cost prohibitive, and definitely not of the densities that we, they were collected at originally. They're also a great way of collecting information in times when you can't leave the field, such as uh, leave the office, such as a global pandemic. They can also provide valuable insights into areas that may now have been developed. And some of the survey areas have now had townships or whole towns built on top of the areas that they cover, which means that we haven't, wouldn't be able to get that information now. So if we ever wanted to know what the geochemistry looked like, it would be overprinted completely by the anthropogenic signal, or we just wouldn't be able to access it at all. We've also found that machine learning provides a very valuable tool at predicting the surface geochemistry at a high resolution. This is great for areas where we don't actually have much information at all, such as that big data gap that we have through Western Australia through South Australia. And we can provide a great tool for finding areas of interest and for future work to go out into the field and collect new samples to really identify what's going on in that region and really drive our understanding. By combining rock and regolith data, we can really increase the understanding and the predictive power of these models. Otherwise, we end up with just a model based on uh, one particular products such as regolith, which isn't really representative of the surface of Australia. We need all of those things together in order to get that information. So I'd like to acknowledge the Mineral Systems branch and everyone in it for providing input data sets, working tirelessly to get a lot of these products across the line. And I'd also like to particularly thank the Mineral Potential of Australia team and the Integrated Geological Mapping team. Um, they've provided invaluable assistance and advice with all of these projects as they've gone on over kind of the last eight years of the Exploring for the Future program. I'd also like to thank the Geoscience Australia laboratory staff. They handle all of the original analysis results as well as sending off the samples for reanalysis and coordinating all of that. Without them, it wouldn't have been possible. And finally, I'd like to thank um, the repository staff for locating and getting out all those historic surveys. Um, some of them haven't been looked at in decades, so it's really good that we have that invaluable resource and they're able to locate them as efficiently as they can. Now, if you'd like any of the data reports, you can go through each of the individual slides, which has the associated DOI for the report, but I've also listed them out here for convenience for you. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Phil. That was a really interesting presentation. And from a personal perspective with the repository, really good to see this legacy sample collections being used in this way. Um, Phil's presentation also really demonstrates the impacts of analysing the item of direct interest to explorers being the elemental concentration. So thanks again to Phil. For our final talk this afternoon, um, for this session, Dr Alex Walker will be presenting on a spotlight on the heavy mineral map of Australia. Alex graduated from Curtin University with a PhD in applied geology and is presently a research fellow at Curtin University's John DeLater Centre. And this is where he's worked as part of a joint Curtin University Geoscience Australia team to generate the world's first continental scale heavy mineral map. Prior to his PhD, Alex worked in the UK as a geotechnical engineer after completing undergraduate studies in geology at the University of Leicester. With research interests focused around applied economic and exploration geology, much of Alex's present research involves heavy minerals, upstream mineral exploration, and mineral deposit characterization with government and industry partners. Thank you very much, Alex. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very happy to be part of this presentation today. Uh, as you just heard, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the heavy mineral map of Australia, the world's first continental scale heavy mineral map. So before I go any further, I should probably elaborate a little bit on what heavy minerals are and what they're useful for. Uh, so heavy minerals are those minerals with a density of approximately 2.9 grams per centimetre cubed or greater. They also tend to be fairly resistant to physical and chemical weathering. So that means that when their sort of their parent rock, their host rock is weathered and the heavy minerals are liberated, they have a tendency to survive that weathering process and also survive transport from that original location downstream uh, into a, a sediment trap or a heavy mineral trap. Now, the reason they're actually useful to us is because certain combinations of heavy minerals can be indicative of specific geological settings or processes, whether that's contact metamorphism, hydrothermal alteration, etc., and also potentially mineralization, which means that when they are liberated from their host rock, they 
can be found by us downstream later on and actually act as a vector to mineralization. And that use of heavy minerals is something that's been refined into pretty much an art form um, in countries like Canada, uh, especially by Canada's Geological Survey for the GEM program, which was mapping footprints on regional and deposit scales around mineral deposits. We've also used it in Australia, uh, but not quite to the same extent, uh, mostly for things like diamond exploration. Now, up until this point, there was no continental scale public domain pre-competitive data set on the natural distribution of heavy minerals uh, anywhere in the world, um, and certainly not in Australia prior to the HMMA. Uh, so this is something that the HMMA was designed to address. So the heavy mineral map of Australia or HMMA is the solution to this, and it's, it's a joint Geoscience Australia Curtin University project to determine a heavy mineral baseline across approximately 81% of Australia. And the heart of the HMMA is a collection of more than 1,300 samples of catchment outlet sediment from nearly 1,200 catchments across the country. And all of these were collected quite a few years ago now as part of the, the National Geochemical Survey of Australia, which in itself was remarkable as Australia's first national scale geochemical survey. So the HMMA has really been quite a long time in the making. The, the visions and the methodologies ultimately that went into the HMMA uh, were themselves underpinned by a pilot project conducted by Patrice de Caratac, formerly at Geoscience Australia, uh, and Brent McInnes of the John Delay Centre. So the samples and the methodologies have all been sort of sometime coming, and there's been a fair bit of thought that's gone into them before, to, before the HMMA. Given the scale of the sample set we were working with, um, and the need to deliver samples, process samples and data in, in a reasonable time frame, we had to develop a fairly novel workflow. Um, opposed to the relatively slow traditional heavy liquid, heavy mineral processing uh, technique that is fairly widespread. What we wound up doing, um, and just to highlight on the figure here, is we wound up taking the 75 to 425 micron fraction of each sample. We extracted the heavy minerals from that using centrifugation and uh, liquid nitrogen and then mounted those in epoxy in 25 millimeter mounts, carbon coated them, polished, etc., and then analyzed them via automated mineralogy. A couple of the unique features on our samples, uh, you can actually see in that picture in the top right of the slide there. So in one row you can see a, on the analytical surface, you can see a black 3D template. That's actually a, a navigation feature. It's a 3D printed plastic shape that we embedded in the surface of each mount to allow for easier navigation when it came to analysis. On the flip side of every sample as well, we have a, a sample ID label, and that contains sample ID details, but also a scannable QR code in the middle of it, which will take you to uh, a Geoscience Australia hosted metadata page for that sample. So you can link it straight back to any relevant metadata. In terms of the automated mineralogy, again, point counting, probably not going to cut it in the timescale we needed the data. So we wound up using uh, the John DeLay Center's state-of-the-art T-Scan Integrated Mineral Analyzer, essentially a very high-spec uh, SEM with a few additional features on top. And we use this to analyze the mineralogy of every single sample. And a typical output from this instrument is that image in the middle there, uh, where you can see the outline of the 3D printed template, um, but you can also see a false color panorama of the sample surface, where every single one of those colored uh, areas represents an analyzed grain. Uh, with a mineralogy assigned to it, and that mineralogy corresponds to a particular colour. And we've actually just got an example uh, legend there just below the figure showing you which colours correspond to which minerals. So we put out something like this for every single sample, uh, in addition to also collecting a wide range of other data as well, grain shape parameters, all of that, uh, plus some EDS data as well. Obviously, that was necessary for the mineral classification. Uh, so for those of you who are really interested in how that was done, I'll just sort of delve into it very briefly. So the teamer itself can be operated in a few different scanning modes, for which basically determines you know, how it's going to collect a backscatter image off the sample and how it's going to collect that compositional EDS data to determine mineralogy. Now, for the HMMA, we determined that dot mapping specifically provided a really nice trade-off between resolution, quality of data, and the time taken per analysis for our sample set of 1,300 plus samples. Uh, and we used um, a backscatter resolution of three microns with an EDS resolution of 27 microns, which worked out pretty well uh, for characterizing a grain range of about 75 to 425 microns for our sample corrections.
Now, a minimum of one EDS point is collected for each grain, um, but ultimately when it's all collected, the team will compare that collected EDS data for an unknown grain and compare it with an associated mineral library and assign a mineralogy to it based on which rules it matches uh, in those definitions. Ultimately, what we wound up with using this technique was a custom mineral library of 163 different minerals, which we had to carefully curate as we went through the lifetime of the project to minimize mineral definition clashes between similar, similar mineral compositions and to minimize any misclassification risk between different minerals as well. So what we've wound up with at the end of the HMA is, of course, several different spreadsheets, CSVs containing a wide range of different properties of the minerals. So we've got uh, observations and the number of uh, observation of a particular mineral in a given sample, um, relative observations where those have been normalized to the total sample population, volume percents of minerals, weight percents, uh, and also median grain sizes. Along with that, we've also provided uh, some data sheets listing all the different minerals within the mineral library, our degree of confidence when it comes to identifying them and associated properties like compositions and potential environments of formation. What we also produced, which I actually think is maybe one of the coolest outputs of the HMA, is a mineral atlas for every single mineral and every single one of those properties. So it's a mineral atlas that comes to a total of more than 800 plus pages, and every single one of them looks something like this image on the right there, which is in this case is for garnite um, and illustrates the distribution of that mineral across the continent. Really fantastic to see. And while obviously the, the overall data set that we've produced is, is really, really valuable, really powerful, um, there can also be a huge amount of information and some really, really interesting features in any given sample as well on a totally different scale. So in one case, uh, we've got these really, really interesting, really unusual cassiterite galena intergrowths in single grains. Uh, and we can see actually at the bottom left there, the original Tima image for these grains is, is pretty decent. And the follow up uh, higher resolution SEM images to the, the left and the top of that, are you know, they provide some more detail, but the Tima image itself is very good. On the right hand side, again, we have the, the Tima image of this unusually spherical grain um, that in higher resolution, you know, it could potentially be something like a cosmic spherical or a kimberlite related spherical. Um, we don't have any answers. Um, if you've got any clue, please write them in on a postcard. There are honestly quite a few stories and many, many interesting threads that came out of the HMA as we went along and analysed these samples. And I think probably one of the, the most powerful ones that we found actually related to garnite, which I, I showed previously, but garnite is a, it's a zinc spinner. It's relatively uncommon. And it's interesting to mineral explorers in that in certain mineral assemblages, it can be indicative of metamorphose based metal mineralization. We look on the figure to the left here, which is the distribution of garnite across Australia. We can see that it is focused in particular areas. And what's really, really interesting is that we see this high concentration of garnite around the Broken Hill locality, which is actually famous for metamorphose based metal mineralization. And within the HMMA data set, we also see it occurring here at Broken Hill with a candrusite in that sample, which is the zinc bearing ilmenite, also indicative of base metal mineralization, and Broken Hill is actually its type locality. So already, just from one or two minerals, we have these fantastic um, insights into how we can use these, these heavy mineral data sets to sort of look at prospectivity across Australia. And that's just one story, really, from the HMA. There are so many questions that we've come up with as we've gone along um, they can yeah sure they can be on a sample by sample basis but they're also simply just, just possibly features of the overarching data set itself so if we rather than look at sort of one individual minerals distribution across the country if we look at mineral diversity the number of minerals that have been identified in each sample across the continent we can potentially see more stories uh, and more questions that should be followed up on. So one question, for example, does mineral diversity vary systematically across the Australian continent in the HMA? And what I've plotted up on the right here is simply a count of unique minerals identified by the team in each given HMA sample plotted on a map of Australia. And the, ba the base layer there is topography or digital elevation. And what I think we can see just on the face of this is that we see much hotter colours 
on the eastern side of the continent, indicating that mineral diversity is probably greater in eastern Australia versus the west. By the same token, if we look at like the far north of Australia, where we have those those cool blues and teals indicating low mineral diversity, is that associated with something like a more humid climate that's prevalent in the north that encourages weathering and destruction of heavy minerals? I don't know. I don't have any answers, but you know, just from looking at this this one feature of the data set, the mineral diversity, we have several questions that are really really interesting and would be very interesting to answer. So we have this massive data set and quite a few ways you can extract information from it. Um, and you know, looking at mineral diversity, interesting questions, etc. Um, but the data set itself is you know it's 1,300 plus samples in. 163 mineral dimensions with a total of more than 140 million individual mineral measurements across the sample set. That's pretty big. Um, it probably doesn't lend itself to easy interpretation via traditional methods like Excel spreadsheets and scatter plots. This was something we had in mind right the way through the project, and we were trying to find a way to get around this and actually easily extract useful information. And what we we hit on was network analysis. So this is. Uh, a subfield of graph theory and it's it's been used for social media and uh, I believe counterterrorism and things like that. We believe that this is actually a useful way to visualize and explore the HMMA data set. It's great at visualizing large multi-dimensional data sets and it allows ready exploration of associations, relationships and spatial distributions within those data sets. So on the right hand side here we've actually got a network graph of seasons one to eight of Game of Thrones and Every single node in this graph is a character. So we've got the likes of Jamie, Tyrion, Sansa. And we can visualize 47,000 interactions between all of the characters in these seasons and easily extract relationships and interpretations. So if we look at this graph, um, we can see that Tyrion has one of the largest names. And actually, this represents the frequency with which Tyrion occurs in the series. So on the, just looking at node size or name size, we can see which, which characters are more common within the series. You can also see a number of lines connecting these nodes or names, and that represents the number of scenes that these characters co-occur in together. So if we look at Tyrion and Daenerys, they're two of the largest nodes there, we can see they've got some reasonably thick lines connecting them, indicating that these characters are both pretty common in the series and they commonly occur in scenes together. Then we also have exclusivity. So again, if we look at Tyrion, and just to the left-hand side, there is a very tiny node for the character Shay. Now that node is small, so it indicates that Shay doesn't show up very often in scenes in Game of Thrones, but her proximity to Tyrion means that when she does show up, it's almost entirely exclusively with Tyrion. So just with those three parameters, size, connection, and exclusivity, we're already extracting if ever the data from a large data set in one figure. So we've applied this to the HMMA data set with our own standalone mineral network analysis app. So this is freely available, hosted by Geoscience Australia online. Uh, I've got a QR code there for those of you who are on mobile. Um, so you can just scan that with the camera. Alternatively, if you just prefer a traditional link, you can get hold of these slides and copy that link and put it into your, into your browser bar. Um, and it will bring you to a page that includes something like this. Uh, and this is a network graph of part of the HMMA data set. So the example I've used here, I could talk for like half an hour on just how to use the, the analysis app itself. Um, but what I've plotted up here for simplicity is simply a subset of the HMMA data. This is just the sulfides that occur in the HMMA. So just by looking at this figure, we can see the likes of pyrite, pyrotite, and chalcopyrite pyrite are the most common by the virtue of their, their node size. And we can also see that something like bornite there occurs less often, but where it does, it occurs in samples that also seem to contain pyrotite chalcopyrite based on its, its proximity to those nodes. On the flip side, you can look at something like lolingite right at the top of the figure there, which has a small node indicating it doesn't show up in the HMMA very often. And where it does, it is exclusively in samples that also contain pyrite. So again, pretty decent amount of data extracted from just one figure on a subset of the HMMA. So I thoroughly recommend everyone goes and looks at this at some point. If you're interested in the, the HMMA and heavy mineral data, you can spend hours pulling apart the data set and you know, downloading subsets that you're interested in. We really wanted to maximize the utility of the data set to potential end users, whether it's academia or mineral explorers. So what we decided to do rather than complete the project and 
push out the data set in its complete form, we decided to take a staggered approach so we could actually receive and sort of integrate feedback from end users. What we did is in July 2022, we released our first subset, partial uh, subset of the data uh, out into the public. And that sort of comprised just over 200 samples with 140 unique minerals. And that covered the, the Darlan Kernamona Delamarian area uh, down in um, the southern end of Australia there. That was very well received. Uh, so we followed that up with a second partial release in December 2022, which covered the Barclay Ice of Georgetown um, in Lyon. So that was 188 samples, a so comparable size, but 153 unique minerals this time. Again, our, our mineral data set, our mineral library is, is expanding as the, the project continues. And finally, we had the release of the revised data set um, alongside a workshop in October 2023 in Perth. Um, so this superseded the, the previous partial releases, and that's all, you know, 1,200 catchments, 1,300 plus samples, 163 unique minerals identified, and the, the more than 140 million individual mineral measurements. Um, so we think this actually worked really, really well. And we got some great feedback as well as we did it. Um, so just on the first partial release, you know, we had former exploration geologists being interviewed in pre-competitive review. Frank Bunting saying that, you know, it's fantastic to see uh, government and uh, the university sector doing this sort of systematic regional scale, continental scale heavy mineral sampling. Um, and that it is useful potentially for finding mineralization that hasn't yet been discovered. We've had exploration companies taking up exploration licenses based on um, portions of the HMMA data set. So in the case of Trinex Minerals, they picked one up in South Australia based on the garnite. Um, much more recently, we've had the exploration company S2 Resources uh, acquiring exploration licenses in New South Wales, partially on the basis of sulfide mineral observations in the HMMA data set, which is fantastic. Uh, for any of you that happen to follow John Anderson on LinkedIn, he has a constant discussion essentially going on, pulling apart the HMMA data set, uh, integrating it with, with other data sets to see what else you can you can extract value wise from it. Uh, it's really interesting to see. So with the HMMA complete, uh, really the question was where to from here? It's, you know, it's a significant milestone and what has been a very long road that started years ago with the, the National Geochemical Survey of Australia. And its success really should be attributed to a combination of using the mature exploration strategy developed in places like Canada, combining that with novel sample processing and state-of-the-art analytical facilities to actually generate a useful data set in a reasonable time frame. And also the really, really remarkable thing, you know, being able to utilize a cons an internally consistent continental scale sample set. And despite everything I've shared with you today and the release of the whole data set itself, there's essentially in my mind an almost untapped volume of data still to be generated from the HMMA. We already see it being used in conjunction with other data sets to uh, generate more value. Um, but you know, every single sample itself contains those heavy mineral grains that can be further analysed for additional data. You know, so we've got the likes of Bedeliite and Apatite, Zircon that can all have geochronological data extracted from them. Uh, so we we encourage people to get in contact and ask, you know, to use some of the sample materials for for additional research. Uh, the only thing we at the HMMA would like to highlight is that some of the material is quite limited. Uh, for some samples, in some cases, only the material on the mount um, exists. Some others have got some archive material as well. So we encourage collaborative research to really maximise the amount of data that can be extracted per grain analysed. So please, if you've got ideas, get in touch. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the spectacular amount of work that was done behind the scenes, both in the Curtin Labs and at Geoscience Australia's lab when it came to processing NGSA data and samples and the HMMA sample set, um, obviously funding through Curtin University and Geoscience Australia via the EFTF program. Uh, the team or instrument itself is funded by a, a collaborative grant from the ARC with support from uh, Curtin, the Geological Survey of Western Australia, UWA and Murdoch University. For those of you interested in some further reading, I've just brought, put up some links to relevant articles there on the right hand side. Uh, and if you have any questions, do get in touch. Thank you. Well, thanks, Alex. Gosh, compiling a data set with hundreds of millions of individual mineral analyses is really an impressive outcome and will surely be a treasure trove of new insights into Australia's geology and geological processes. And it's really great to hear that you think there's so much, still so much potential in these data sets. 
So that was the final presentation of the session this afternoon, so we're now going to move on to the question and answer session. Our presenters Anand and Phil are here in the studio with me and we have Alex joining us online and they're ready to answer your questions. Please keep adding your questions in the Q&A panel on your screen and please include the name of the presenter that you'd like to ask. To kick things off, I have a question for all of you. And this one's from me. So you are all characterising different properties of the surface and the near surface. In this morning's session, we saw attempts to incorporate the information from passive seismic, magnetotelerics and xenoliths into a unified model of the subsurface. Is it possible to formally link the different properties that you are characterising? And I'll start off um, with Phil, please. Um, yep, thank you for the question. So. I guess the natural linkage between the heavy minerals and geochemistry is quite obvious. Um, the heavy minerals are separate from the geochemistry, geochemistry samples that we've collected, so it's that extra information that we're gaining about the surface um, using those minerals in combination with the chemistry, and obviously I'll let Alex go into a bit more depth in terms of what his thoughts are in terms of maybe he's extrapolating some more information and how he would go about expanding that. and gaining more information. I think the trickier part is the linkage between the AEM and the surface geochemistry. Um, just because a lot of the samples we collect are at the, the very top surface, that kind of zero to 10 centimeters, which is kind of within, and I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but it kind of in the noise zone for what we would see within the AEM data set. It can um, be. Yeah. But obviously, I mean, larger features throughout the landscape should come through from the AEM. The, trends in the geology and where um, areas of outcropping, areas of deeper clays all come up and can be mapped using the AM as well and then we can use the geochemistry in combination to try and gain more information about those units and how they're at the surface but and I don't know if you have more um, thoughts. Yeah no as in see the surface is pretty heterogeneous or can be and so you know how these linkages work between different kinds of data sets will vary from place to place depending on the surface processes that are prevalent in the area. Um, more specifically about things like empty conductivities and seismic velocities, um, see it is, it is a, a challenging and a bit of a tricky question and I think it merits a lot more thought because you know what the physics tells us is directly about well the conductivity or the velocity, and then how these things link together uh, at high pressures and temperatures. Um, there's a numbers of there's a number of ways in which to formulate these relationships, and there's linear ways, there's nonlinear ways, there's all kinds of coefficients. Um, then you could go at it from purely statistical point of view as well. If you have the information where these th where these two properties are coincident, um, so it is not uh, a given that there is any one way that is correct for characterizing these relationships. Um, and so yes, it is a very interesting and very challenging question. And um, as uh, Mark Hoggart pointed out today in the uh, earlier sessions, um, he's got some excellent ideas on how to do this. Um, Alex, would you like to jump in there? Yeah, absolutely. Just to build on what uh, Phil was saying as well, um, geochemistry is probably the most natural pairing uh, with the heavy mineral data set. Um, not all heavy minerals are made equally, and some of them tend to hang around for shorter periods of time than others, uh, particularly the sulfites, for instance. So where they may be missing in, in some heavy mineral assemblages, you might still see a remnant of their, their geochemistry within a geochemical data set associated with those those materials. That's great. Well, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next question. And this question is for Anand, and it's from Anna Petz. Please, will there be a quick look guide for the AEM products? Really enjoyed this overview today and learned a lot. Thanks so much, Anna. Thanks, Susanna. And, and thank you, Anna, for that sentiment. Um, yeah. So we do have uh, a number of products that you could use to learn a little more about um, everything that we're rolling out in terms of AEM. So we had a showcase in Perth uh, at the end of 2022, I think it was. So if you go to the Heike GA website and you pull up the showcase branch, uh, you'll find a bunch of YouTube links uh, about us explaining all things uh, AEM, including the probabilistic products. And um, we also have for this particular release that I talked about, you know, the probabilistic products, uh, there is an associated ECAT release number. And would you believe it? I actually remember what the number is. It's 149375. Um, and what that does is it actually tells you a little bit about what these products are, how we got them, um, what is a good way to visualize them, um, what the formats available are. 
So it's all on ECAT. Um, and if you look at the, the slide pack, um, which will be available soon as well, uh, at the end of the day, I think, or the video, there are links in uh, the section of links that I had in, in the slides, which will also take you to these uh, products and uh, more of an explanation as to uh, how to use these uh, probabilistic features. Great, thanks Anand. Um, so I've got another question here come through. This one's for Phil, and this is from Mark um, Duffett. So parts of the predictive covariates are themselves predictions, e.g. thorium over potassium in southwest Tasmania. Are these predictors kept out of the geochem estimate in those areas? Uh, thanks for the question, Mark. It's an excellent uh, point that you're raising there. Uh, no, they're not. Um, we use all the covariates that we list for each of the major oxides. Um, so for each major oxide, there'll be a list of which covariates went into it, um, as well as the feature ranks to say how important they were. But there's been no masking of the covariate feature data sets. And that's purely because we're working at a national scale. We can't really afford to start masking a lot of our data sets if there's gaps in the data, because otherwise we just wouldn't be able to produce national predictive maps. Um, obviously, those uncertainty maps can come into play for defining areas where um, the model didn't perform as well and also if you have knowledge of things that you don't think are strong predictors maybe you don't think that um, the predictive uh, product of forum of potassium over southwest tasmania is very good you can just ignore those areas that's i guess the power of having these as national data sets where you can zoom into areas and pick and choose which areas you do and don't trust um, obviously there's the geochemistry to back up some of those areas so you can really test the relationships there to gain your own uh, understanding and decisions based on what you would trust and what you wouldn't. Thanks, Phil. So, question for Alex from Michael Sexton. What established complex network analysis techniques already used in examining social graphs, network topologies, etc., could be used in the mineral network analysis? So, thank you for the question. Um, it's one of the more interesting sort of parts of the project, uh, for me at least. Um, it's quite difficult to find a suitable technique for a data set like this because it is so highly dimensional and also so sparse in some of those dimensions. Um, network analysis was one of the main ones we gravitated to, I believe. I've also heard of uh, parallel coordinates as well. It might be a potential method. It's not one we explored a huge amount. Um, you know, sort of traditional techniques like dimensionality reduction, you are not entirely straightforward to, to apply to a, a data set of this size and dimensionality either. Again, due to its, its sparse nature, you've got to be quite careful about how you do it. Yeah, thanks, uh, Alex. And I'm going to um, just follow up on that question um, and um, pass that on to Phil, actually. Um, or Anand, please jump in as well. Um, if there's um, any possibility of applying network analysis to add value to your data sets. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely there is. Um, we already apply, I guess, dimensionality reduction to a lot of the geochemistry that we do. We have significantly less dimensions than uh, the heavy mineral data set. We only typically operate between, I guess, 50 to 60 elements, and we use dimensionality reduction to try and gain uh, information on the broad picture as to what's going on within a region. But um, network analysis could also be used to try and gain those linkages across each of the geochemical elements and map how they're sitting across the environment and use those subsets to try and gain more information about the landscape and how it relates to the geochemistry, certainly. Yeah, this is a really interesting question where one could begin to work with, and I hate to use this term, you know, big data methods, because very often what you'll find is that, you know, you want to be doing a bit of an inference and you might know certain things. And so you might have this huge ensemble with various properties um, with many, many dimensions. And you're like, well, if I constrain this bunch of properties over there, well, what does that mean for the rest of the stuff? So yes, indeed. So network analysis or parallel coordinates, as Alex just mentioned, um, does allow you to delve into this uh, very, very thoroughly. And especially if you're trying to test out various theories and you've got a probabilistic, and this is where my Bayesian bias comes in, uh, with, with Bayesian techniques, you can, you can have a posterior of say seismic velocities or electromagnetic conductivities. And you could say, well, in this area, I know what the conductivities ought to be or the velocities ought to be, and I'm gonna constrain them in this area. Well, then that'll have implications over you know, the other connected parts of the model as well. So um, this is a very exciting uh, area of research where um, you know, cluster analysis or 
different methods of basically asking the right questions to the data to be able to mm. come up with meaningful um, possible multiple hy hypotheses because you know we're only observing the earth from the surface and what implications this has for the geology in the subsurface we're sort of guessing at so if you're able to do these kinds of probabilistic exercises and play these games really it's a lot of fun and you can learn a lot mm -hmm. yeah absolutely all right well we'll move on to the next question <clears throat> This is turning out to be a really interesting conversation and discussion. So thank you so much for the questions and keep them coming through. Um, so we've got a question uh, for Anand um, from Ned Stoltz. So have you inverted any Oz AEM lines with 2D, 2.5D and 3D and compared these with the Geoscience Australia layered earth inversions? Do we lose much geological information by limiting to 1D model inversions? Yeah, thanks, Susanna, and, and thanks, Ned, for that question. As you're probably aware, we've, we've thought about this a lot. So I'm not sure if I can draw comparisons uh, between 1D, 2D, and 2.5D or 3D inversions for Oz AEM, but I have looked at them in uh, other parts of the Northern Territory, like um, Howard's East, etc., and where we do have you know, very high, high density um, line spacing, I think they're off the order of 250 meters or so, which you, know, you typically would need for 3D inversions. Um, and we were not able to discern a great deal of difference between um, you know, the 1D, uh, 2D, and 2.5D inversions. And I think this boils down to the fact that unless the Earth is extremely jointed or fractured or in some way very, very broken up, um, the way the physics of airborne electromagnetics works is that, you know, you're, you're unlike in the seismic method, say, for example, you're, you're carrying both your transmitter and your receiver along with you. So you're sort of, you know, you've got source receiver coincidence. So if that's happening, everything's sort of going down and coming back up. And yes, you are diffusing currents into areas adjoining where you're directly sensing over. But essentially, you know, your sensitivity kernel is limited to what you're flying over. So um, you're not really particularly sensitive to 2D or 3D structure. And we have um, good noise models. We have statistics, like we fly repeat lines, we fly high altitude lines. So we know what our noise is like. So if we're able to fit our data with 1D models, and I'll have to make a distinction here, that 1D models imply 3D physics though, as in even though we treat the variation in the Earth as one dimensional, the physics is fully 3D. Um, if we're able to fit the acquired data with 1D models, then you know it, it, it does not behoove us to then go to 2D or 3D because we're introducing uh, complexity in the model uh, when we are not required to use that complexity to explain the data. So that's sort of why we've been a little leery of, of 2D or 3D models. Yeah, great. Thank you, Anand. Um, next question. Um, we've got a, another question from Anna Petz for Phil. So, love the integrated data with oxides, DEM, and the landscape. Do you think there will be an integration of these data sets with mineral potential mapping and even predictive geochemistry? Um, thanks for the question, Anna. So, I guess I'll answer the last part first. Um, so, the machine learning maps that were produced by John Wilford and Patrice are predictive um, oxides for each of those major oxides. So. Uh, it's predictive element maps. That's why they've got the uncertainty associated um, with them. We have large data gaps across Australia, particularly in Western Australia, um, and this is one way we've been able to fill that information. I know there is definitely consideration of using more geochemistry in with um, the mineral potential mapping work that we do here at Geoscience Australia, and that sync we'll be looking at as we move into our next phase through our RAP program, and I guess it's a watch this space on that side. Thanks, Phil. Um, I'm just going to hop to a question for, for Alex, and I'm going to go to a, a pre-canned one that I have prepared here. So, um, Alex, um, just a question for myself. The heavy mineral map data set is, is amazing, as I mentioned before. Um, though the current data co coverage based on the NGSA survey um, samples is quite sparse. Um, what data density would be ideal to maximise the application of this method? Yeah, thank you. Um... So this is something that we've thought about a fair bit in the HMMA team. And I think really it comes down to what sort of question are you trying to answer? So, for instance, if you're looking for something very, very high resolution, sort of very short term, short scale changes in mineralogy, that's probably not going to be reflected completely within some of the HMMA catchments. They cover some fairly large areas. 
um, something we uh, investigated in parallel uh, with the HMMA was a, a much higher resolution uh, catchment uh, heavy mineral project around uh, Julemar, the nickel copper cobalt PGM prospect in Western Australia. So rather than, you know, uh, 1300 samples across the, the entirety of the continent, we wound up with, you know, tens and tens of samples separated by, you know, less than a kilometre in some cases in the, the catchments around Julemar. Um, and what that lets you do is, and it's it's quite important for sulphide mineralization because again, the further you get away from the source of a sulphide, um, the less likely it is it's going to be around for very long. Um, they weather away pretty quickly. Um, so if the question were sort of trying to map up the footprint for a mineral deposit, you'd want to be looking on kilometers, maybe tens of kilometers at most, depending on how thick, big you think that, that vector or that footprint might be. So it depends on the question. Yeah, thanks, Alex. And um, yeah, I've noticed that that particular point has come up a couple of times now. It's asking the right questions and seeing how the how we can manipulate mm. the data. Absolutely. Or acquire the data in the first place to address those questions. Thank you. All right, moving on. Um, another question um, for Anand from Wes Nichols. So, hi, Anand. A great and entertaining presentation from a geologist perspective. Has any work been done on utilising the AUSAEM data to define groundwater, especially deeper seated groundwater that, than currently being utilised by conventional water supply systems, i.e. from alluvial or upper lithospheric groundwater su supply between over 200 metres to one kilometre below the surface? Oh, thanks, Susanna, and, and thanks, Wes, uh, for your question. Um, so I'll answer that question in two parts, uh, because it'll make life easier for me. Uh, has any work been done using the AUSAEM data? Well, yes, indeed. Um, for example, if you consider the Upper Darling uh, floodplain where we've conducted this very high density survey as part of the AUSAEM program, uh, it might not be 20 kilometers spaced. Um, it's, it's far uh, more tightly spaced. And yes, as in we have done quite a bit of work um, and I ask you to wait till uh, the next few sessions, Friday, I believe it is, when Dr. Sarah Buckerfield and Dr. KP Tan will be talking about how they've been using the AEM in conjunction with uh, surface NMR uh, data to figure out what might be good areas for managed aquifer recharge. Um, and in general, you know, the, the Oz AEM, the 20 kilometer space data, has provided the framework to determine where water could lie. Because as you know, water, at least the type that we, we like to drink, is resistive and airborne electromagnetics is good at, you know, indicating where conductors are. Uh, sometimes, because things in Australia tend to be so old um, and the water can be salty, we, we can detect, um, you know, water that has a certain level of salinity with airborne electromagnetics, but really, you need to bring in the framework of the geology and the hydrogeology to be able to do groundwater work. Um, and, and this has been done uh, with uh, the 20 kilometer space data as well. Um, but, you know, 200 meters to one kilometer below the surface. Now, now that's a bit of a hard ask because it, it depends on the conductivity of the near surface as well. So if you've got conducting near surface sediments, the, the penetration depth of the AEM signal is not going to be that deep. Um, but I ask you to look at the data from the Kimberleys, where it's extremely resistive, and we can see down to, you know, uh, 600 meters depth almost. And so I would say that there is potential for, for, you know, being able to investigate groundwater systems at that depth in, in the Kimberleys, simply because, you know, the near surface is so resistive. So um, I wouldn't rule it out. It's just that, you know, we've collected all this data over, you know, nearly 67% of the country now. And we're just beginning to see where we could utilize uh, this AEM data and the conductivity imaging that people like Yusen and Lake Cooper have done um, uh, for a variety of purposes, you know, whether it be minerals exploration or whether it be groundwater. Um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't rule it out, but it is dependent on the geology of the area. Thanks, Anand. Um, Alex, another question from you, from Mark Duffett. Alex, which mineral will end up on the critical metal throne? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the incredibly difficult question. <laughs> I, oh, who knows? Obviously, it's it's not looking great for nickel or lithium at the moment, but their time will come back around again. Um, yeah, I couldn't say. Fortunately, the HMA 
you know, covers about 160 different minerals, most uh, several of which are associated with, you know, different deposit styles. So I think you could probably hedge your bets and keep an eye on all of them. Thanks, Alex. Um, all right, I'm going to hand this one to Phil. Um, so um, great presentations. Um, can you use the network analysis at the national scale to infer relationships associations at the deposit scale, for example, for potential byproducts? Well, it's a, <laughs> that's an interesting question there, Heather. <laughs> Shame that Alex wasn't first up here because um, I guess a lot of the heavy mineral stuff would be more of an indicator. Um, obviously, we can pick up some information, not necessarily from a network analysis standpoint, but more from just a general understanding of our data and how that infers different deposit types, what we can pick up. Um, if we look at some of our high resolution data, then we may be able to start to see some of that distal footprints of some deposit types. And if we know that that particular deposit type has potential for a particular byproduct, um, then sure. But I mean, byproducts in themselves are pretty complicated in their relationships with mineral deposits. Um, some of the times it's pretty opportunistic in terms of what's available within the surrounding lithology for those minerals to pick it up. Um, it can be, require certain redox conditions, as well as certain elements being present within um, either the crystal lattice of the mineral of interest to even pick them up into the deposit. So um, I don't know if we'd be able to get that from our national data set, but it, you could probably, as a targeted standpoint, get closer towards that kind of footprinting standpoint to understand what deposits we have potential for, and then from there understand what we could have on those byproduct standpoint. I don't know if Alex wanted to pitch in more from the heavy mineral side of things, or uh, I suppose yeah, maybe just one comment. It's, it's tricky with geochemical data because you know they're all dependent variables on one another. Um, that's something we had to navigate around to begin with the, the mineral data set because they don't just come in observations, they can come in weight percent you know, from a sample. Um, and with every, you can obviously do transformations to, to render those variables independent, but you, with every sort of transformation step, you get further and further away from your original data set. I don't know, maybe just network analysis wouldn't be the most natural pairing for, for geochemistry. Um, I'd like to see it tried though. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Look, um, this has been a really informative question and answer session. Um, unfortunately, I do have to draw things to a close. I'd like to say thank you again to our presenters, Anand, Phil and Alex, and thank you to everyone who's attended today's session and submitted questions. There is still an opportunity to ask further questions or to get in touch with us through our email address at eftf.gov.au. I will correct that. It is eftf at ga.gov.au. The showcase will continue in around about 30 minutes at 3pm local Canberra time with our next session, Maps of Australian Geology Like Never Before. Remember that the link for this session will also work for that next session. And if you missed anything from today's session or would like to re-watch something, the recordings will be available in the coming days and they'll be available through our showcase webpage, ga.gov.au forward slash show showcase. Um, thank you again to our presenters. Thanks to all of our um, participants in this afternoon's session and we look forward to seeing you again shortly.